Thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for a chance to be here with you. Uh, what I'd like to do in, in the next minutes is first spend some time talking about uh, the phenomenon of aging. Although we all recognize it, I think there are some stark depictions of the degree to which it is changing our nation, our world, and our societies. And then to elaborate a bit on some of the exciting basic science and the way it's providing an understanding of mechanisms that hope, will hopefully will be translated into improvement both in lifespan and most importantly into health span. So this is a, a, a slide which depicts the change in the population of the world, under five children, over 65. So if you begin looking at the left starting in 1950 and 60, there are about three times as many people worldwide over 65 as there were, so under five as there were 65. It was a very young population. And quite remarkably, between that time, a relatively short time to the present, almost the day in which we sit here, you'll see these lines crossing, which means for the first time in human history, there are approximately as many children under five as there are adults over 65. And the demographics are uh, projected to continue so that we'll have a society that is overwhelmingly predominantly older adults versus younger children. Uh, it's a reflection of a lot of success in terms of the ability to support life early, survive through childhood and through older age, but it's created, without going into, into great depth, enormous changes in the whole social structure with implications that are going to be with us at present and for the future. Now, another interesting uh, set of facts that I'll take you through a little thought exercise on is illustrated here. This is a, a, a characterization of the maximum life expectancy of women, because women historically and continue to live longer than men, in whatever nation at that year had the longest longevity. So you can see from 1840 to 1920, over a period of 80 years, that goes up from 45 to 65. So every four years, there's an increase of one year in life expectancy, 20 years over the 80 years shown here. And if we'd been sitting here in 1920 and asked whether we thought this, this could continue at this pace or was likely to, uh, we all have our own answers, but I'm not sure we all were so sure it would happen. But I don't know why this is a straight line, and maybe the, the statisticians, the mathematicians, the demographers, can, uh, can bear upon it, but straight line or no, the, the, the trend has continued all through seen here for 2000, so from 1840 now to 2000, 160 years, there's been an increase of 40 years. That means if you sit here for an hour, your life expectancy goes up for 15 minutes. <laughs> and, and so it goes. And now how many of us really think from 2000 to 2080, we'd be going from 85 to 105 at that same slope? It may happen, I don't know, but it's, a, I think, already just an extraordinary accomplishment. And to point out, it's not a curve which represents a single event. In the early years, this was largely survival of children. Later years, a survival in older age. There's a difference between life expectancy or average life expectancy and maximal life expectancy, and that's an interesting debate of science as well. This is a picture, woman known to many of us, Jean Calment, a French woman, who lived to the age of 122 years, five months, 14 days. That's about 20 years ago, the time of her death. It has, nobody's exceeded that yet, but small numbers, short time. Unclear what currently, with our armamentarium of interventions and lifestyles, is the maximum life expectancy. And many, from the science to the science fiction, will project what might change this. But uh, an important distinction to make, average life expectancy and, and uh, maximal. Uh, interesting story about Jean Calment. Her, late in her life, her lawyer offered to purchase her home, that is, to make it a possession of her own in exchange for the right to take over when she died. Uh, that purchase, I guess, was a very poor investment on his part because she's far outlived uh, everyone, friends and family. But some, some, some sobering facts, differences in the way life expectancy has projected itself over the country. So this is life expectancy gains and increased uh, with, with increases in health spending for nations across the world. So what you see on the, uh, on the x-axis is health expenditures. What you see on the y-axis is life expectancy at birth. And you can see the United States, first of all, the bottom right is an outlier, spending more than twice as much on health expenses as any of the other uh, economically well-off countries. And it does so with no advantage, as you can see, in terms of lifespan. Um, if we look a little further, what, what's behind what goes on in the US, there's this uh, extraordinary and very, very sobering figure, which looks at what's happened to life expectancy f beyond age 50 
for women on the right, men on the left, uh, over the years from 1920 through 1950, that is year of birth. So you can see for the richest men and women, that top line, the richest 10%, over the course of the time from birth year 20 to, to 50, life expectancy at age 50 has increased quite substantially. But look at how remarkable the impact is of socioeconomic group or income level. So that for men, the poorest 10% gained hardly at all and even more sh shocking and striking for women, for birth cohorts from 1920 to 1950, there's been a dramatic decrease in life expectancy. Another, uh, it's equally shocking and disturbing picture of what goes on in the United States. This is some work from, from, from Case and Deaton, who looked at so-called deaths of despair. That is deaths that could be attributed to drug use, alcohol use, and suicide mortality in non-Hispanic whites at this, at this point by birth cohort again. So looking at those who are less than a bachelor's degree in education, that's what I'm showing you first here, as you move from, from uh, 19... 80 on through uh, uh, decreasing to the earlier years. As years have gone on, the proportion or rate of death from deaths of despair at a given age has increased enormously or dramatically. So back in the 1950s or so, those good old days, very rare to have these deaths of despair, even at older ages. But a very disturbing trend of what's increased here, and we've seen this nationally, there's been a lot of publicity. What happens to people who have a bachelor's degree or more? No, effect, no such effect at all. Now, maybe not surprising to us that there'd be an impact of socioeconomic group or of, edu or of education, but this is just extraordinary and, and rather unforgivable. It says that these are clearly remediable variables that affect health span, lifespan across the country. Now, in terms of some things we can do something about, and these are modest examples, what do we do about opioid use? This is one interesting study that was carried out in, um, in uh, California. It, uh, the intervention was simply to tell physicians who had prescribed opioids and whose patients then died of an overdose to notify them that that death had occurred and then to compare that to a group who received no such notification. And over a short time, there was about a 10% decrease in prescription of opioids. We hope a decrease in prescription of inappropriately prescribed opioids. But an example of the way in which nudges or changes in policy, uh, this one, not all obtrusive, simply informing people of the consequences, in this case clinicians, can make a difference. There are other uh, behavioral variables that undoubtedly can make a difference as well. But I want to turn from these examples of what goes into life and death to what we're learning about the biology of aging and the way in which that can impact our ability to change health span. So, not a surprise to you if we plot for this large number of conditions, the prevalence as a function of age, uh, it's enough to just look at the whole set and see that they all increase dramatically with age. And this has led to the question, among others, about whether in addition to the organ or tissue or disease specific variables that are changing with age, there are issues of the underlying aging process itself which are impacting and have become risk factors for disease so that interventions with those basic changes that occur with aging might impact many diseases and outcomes. The causes of death here that are major are illustrated, and the issue of whether we can impact on the survival past many of these rather than, or rather than or in addition to treating the causes of each individually is illustrated here. So the biology of disease somehow impacts and relates to these many prominent disease entities shown here, but the biology of disease can also be broken down into a number of processes shown here. So proteostasis, the ability to maintain protein structure, uh, the immune response, stem cell viability, uh, metabolism, epigenetics, um, and I'll go on to illustrate then next what has become the termed geroscience, which is the convergence of the biology of aging and its contributing components to the impact of aging on disease. And geroscience, a term that was coined at the Buck Institute now in California, uh, now defines the science or the premise that by understanding the basic biology of aging, we can address the processes of aging and in doing so affect the risk factors for not just one or, or two, but for multiple diseases for which aging is an important risk factor, and that's geroscience. Uh, geroscience has focused on a number of so-called pillars or components. 
Uh, and I'd like to focus on uh, just one, which is going to be the area of cell senescence and what it can do and what it can mean in terms of understanding aging and the promise for interventions. Back in 1961, not so long ago, Len Hayflick uh, made a remarkable observation, remarkable in its time. He was culturing human fibroblasts. And it was generally assumed at this time that if you took cells from skin, or other sources, put them into culture, they would live forever. They were no more bound by the usual constraints. But the curve shown here, observed in 1961, showed that uh, yes, the, the ability of cells to replicate would continue for a period of time, and then it would collapse. And it would collapse at a predictable number of cell divisions. And this was so-called cell senescence, the notion that if cells multiplied beyond a certain number of divisions, they were doomed to enter a, cell of, a state of senescence in which they could no longer divide, they were irreversibly senescent. And in addition, as we'll talk about, not only did they become unable to, to divide, but they took on uh, very characteristics and at times counterproductive, dangerous, or threatening phenotype. So that got translated over the years in understanding what changes occur as cells senesce. And this is one example from the um, lab of Ned Sharpless, who uh, was one of our advisors at the Aging Institute until he became director of the Cancer Institute. And, I must say, as an important aside, has led to a, a, an, an even enhanced interaction between our two institutes in a very productive way. But what, what his laboratory and others identified was that among molecular changes that occur at a time of senescence is an increase in expression of P16. It's a gene which encodes a product that is important for cell cycle regulation. And with a high level of P16, cells don't divide so well anymore. What's shown in the graph is with chronologic age, the numbers increase. And then an interesting imaging technique showed that in a mouse, for example, with a, with a very clever reporter for P16, that in multiple tissues, the number of senescent cells increases. Now, it never gets very high. I want to point out it's, an, it's important that it's a very small percentage of cells that are senescent. And it was only that a very small fraction of our cells in every organ or tissue were non-functional. One would not think or anticipate it would necessarily cause a great deal of damage. But they're not just passive, non-dividing cells, as I mentioned. They have characteristics such as a secretory phenotype, which is generally pro-inflammatory, can have adverse consequences. And so the issue was raised, what would happen if we could remove these senolytic cells? And over the past several years, some very uh, innovative and creative approaches were taken, some of which bear, bore upon the fact that P16 was overexpressed, as shown here, in cells that were senescence. So by building into cells a genetic suicide, they would allow one with a drug at any point in time to kill off all those cells expressing P16, which were therefore senescent, and see what happens. The outcome is illustrated here in some of the early reports. So mice at various ages were treated with a drug which turned on the enzyme, which killed the cells that were expressing P16. And as a result, you can see in terms of on the, the, the first set of graphs, gastrocnemias or abdominal muscles, in two sets of transgenic mice, when you add the drug, muscle mass, fiber diameter increases. And if on the right you look at more functional outcomes, these mice were able to run longer, greater distance, perform more work, and in subsequent experiments, even live longer. So by eliminating senescent cells, one opened in an animal model this kind of impact. And this is quickly moving now to clinical trials in humans, not with genetic modeling, but with drugs which target specifically senescent cells and our so-called senolytics. And we're seeing a remarkable translation from basic science in a relatively short period of time into clinical trials and first in kind in humans. Just to point out, uh, with all due respect to the age-old caloric restriction as one of the first and most uh, generalized impacts upon aging or life expectancy, models in most but not all strains of mice and in rats, and, and important to note this is not absolutely universal, but in, in a predominance of animal models, show that if it goes from the, the curve that's left most with animals dying most rapidly on an ad lib, ad -lib diet, if you go to the curve on the, on the far right with caloric restriction, typically a 30% or so decrease in calorie intake after they've reached sexual maturity, there's a very reproducible in most but not all uh, animal models increase in, in, in life. Uh, this particular slide is meant to show that there's a, a wide variety of variants on caloric restriction being attempted because of the very fact that it's simply hard to get humans to comply indefinitely with a caloric restriction diet. So this is one example, an intermediate line of a single meal feeding. In this particular case, the animals are in human trials ongoing, uh, can in fact eat all they want but just one meal a day. And even more sophisticated than that, if we try to understand what the impact is of caloric restriction, it appears to be not just 
less, fewer calories and loss of weight, but it really is impacting undoubtedly on the metabolic impact and the stress of periods of fasting. So understanding just how long a fasting period is necessary to achieve that outcome and at what periodicity is a subject, again, of translational studies ongoing. And I want to turn now just to one of the conditions raised in a number of previous talks that is a, a, an extraordinary human tragedy and also threatens the, the economic, social, uh, as well as human uh, quality of, of our life, and that's Alzheimer's disease, which in this country is affecting some 5 million and more Americans. In terms of total cost, uh, though cost in dollars is not the only metric and probably not the, the primary beyond uh, human suffering, here shown for dementia versus cancer, heart disease, and other diseases is the demonstration that one includes formal and informal care, out-of-pocket out expenses, federal funding, uh, that, um, that uh, dementia, in fact, in, in later life is, is far and away the most expensive outcome. And if you refer back to those slides we looked at at the very beginning showing the, the increase in lifespan and average age, the projection for the number of people, if nothing changes in terms of ability to intervene, who will be struck with dementia in later years of life uh, is extraordinary, projected to, to triple in the next 20 years or so. It's simply untenable in terms of human suffering and, and societal burden. And, and recognizing this, the National Alzheimer's Project Act was signed into law in 2011. Uh, there a lot of laws passed. They say a lot of nice things, but this one really had some teeth to it in that it inspired a real effort across the nation to look at multiple levels, but including that of, of supporting research to address the problem of Alzheimer's disease. And this is an indication of how much is being spent now. This is the uh, NIH spending uh, on Alzheimer's and related dementias. So you can see the curve going up so that from 2015 through 2018, that's the last fiscal year now completed, there's essentially a tripling of the amount spent. This year, um, despite all of the fiscal complexities in our budget. The National Institute on Aging was targeted within another $425 million towards Alzheimer's disease. So the total spending by the federal government through NIH now on Alzheimer's and related dementias is some $2.3 billion. And uh, with that enormous opportunity uh, comes the obligation for all of us collectively in a research community to bring to bear the, the, the best ideas in the hands of investigators who can move forward on multiple fronts to make progress. And to illustrate uh, the kinds of framework in which we think about making progress, uh, there's a strong conviction shown off to the right, uh, aisle three, uh, item three, if we're going to intervene, and this is in the face we have to acknowledge of multiple failures of attempts to target Alzheimer's disease in the past, uh, strong conviction that one of the reasons for the failures is that we're intervening too late. So if one waits until a point, we'll look at this in a little more detail, where individuals have even the earliest of symptoms and then begins to treat, the conviction, based on the kind of data that I'll show you in a moment, is that by that time, uh, too much potentially irreversible damage has occurred in the brain, and so it's imperative to begin treating early. Well, if you're going to do that, what does one need to do? You have to have an identification of who is at risk, and that's the top line there, an example of identifying who is at risk if you had genetic markers for who is at highest risk. And then the panels below, you have to, have to identify a way to know if people have the underlying disease process years before outcome and a way to track that so you can the people at high risk intervene early and track whether those treatments are effective or not. In terms of genes, uh, the first genes that are actually causative of Alzheimer's disease were identified in the early 1990s, and there are just three. There's the amyloid gene, which encodes the plaques that Professor Alzheimer's first saw in his first patient in 1906. And two other presenilins, which are genes encoding enzymes that cleave to make a peptide from that same uh, protein or amyloid precursor. So all focused around amyloid. And then there was a gap after having shown that ApoE4, another lipo, uh, important lipoprotein, was a risk factor that was not causative, but increased the risk several fold in people who had the wrong allele. Then came the uh, human genome and its solution and the ability to scan across large numbers of people to find out what other genes were risk factors. And you can see year by, by year the number of increases that occurred here until this year in, in 2018, year just passed, more than 30 new genes on top of all these illustrated here. And it's one thing to identify a gene, another to understand what you do after having identified them. Important here, color-coded, 
not, not so visible, I'm sure, to all of you, I, I apologize, but that they identify pathways, inflammatory pathways, lipid transport, a number of those that now become predominant candidates for what's underlying the, um, the disease process around uh, Alzheimer's type dementia and opportunities to target interventions. So if one looks at the kinds of changes that can be found, like identification of amyloid in the brain and how that increases with time, that's the top of the lines you see here, with some data that I'll illustrate for you quite graphically, what we know is that in the area in white after symptoms where we've been treating patients until now, maximal deposition of amyloid has already occurred. So if we're going to treat, we're going to have to reverse. But also strikingly, there are a number of other biomarkers. Some of those things that go down are decreases in metabolism, decreases in the volume of the hippocampus, a part of the brain important in memory. Those are all losing volume for years before symptoms first appear. In retrospect, there's at least one strong reason why the kinds of late interventions that we were trying were not working. So we turn now to some very interesting studies, very much ongoing. Uh, this is an example that takes the case of those early onset genes first described in the 1990s. They're familial. If you have this mutation, or a mutation, any one of these three genes, and rather than having a risk of dementia of the Alzheimer's type, which usually occurred in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there's early onset in a family, and it's predictable in 50s, 40s, even 30s. If you inherit the gene from a parent, a gene that is causative, you have that same predictable onset of disease. If you don't, you're like the rest of us at risk later in life. So the, this family in, in Medellin uh, region of Colombia uh, is the largest such cohort. And uh, just to give, give you a sense of the despair of these people, we all, I, mean, I must say in my first visits to, to Medellin, uh, the, the, the immediate connection was, was the, the horror that that country underwent with drugs and violence. In the midst of all that, these were people living in the hills and the mountains, affected by disease who were trekking on foot, by mule, by bike, by bus, to a center to be participating now in these studies, highly motivated themselves, but uh, inspiring to talk to and their wish to do something for others. So we now have a population we know, if affected by the gene causing uh, amyloid deposition and um, dementia, will have onset early in life. And what you can see here are some brain scans, and this is a critical example of the technology of recent years that allows us now to visualize the plaques that, that uh, Professor Alzheimer saw only after death, and now to image them with the ligands that bind specifically to that in the brain. So on the top, you see the picture of non-carriers, people in their 30s from this family, contrast to their siblings down below who have acquired the gene and will be developing dementia. The pseudo colors here go from the soft colors to the reds as more and more intense deposition. And here you can see with people in their 30s already these changes, and we know these are years before the onset of their symptoms. And as an illustration now, so we now can reconstruct what's going on in the brain for decades before the, on, the onset of, of disease. So you see here a scan of somebody 25 years before expected onset of disease, little or no deposition of amyloid. And now if you track the scale on the bottom, we're going year by year. So we're still 20 years before disease appears and already some first increase in amyloid, 15 years before any symptoms appear, 10 years before symptoms. And so by the time the first of symptoms have appeared, there's already a maximum deposition of amyloid in the brain. And what this now means is we can use scans like this to track people for natural history, but ultimately, most importantly, when being treated to see if we can arrest the course of this change, not having to wait 10 and 20 years to see if there are cognitive changes. And it's in this kind of area where, where hope rises. So now multiple such biomarkers being developed. We've new, moved the case of interventions almost universally, not having forgotten, not having given up hope to treat those people with disease and symptoms, but moving in addition to trying to prevent those changes by earlier interventions. And there are now some 140 different kinds of treatment and interventions being supported uh, across NIA and NIH. Uh, some of them are drugs, some of them are gene targeting, uh, some of them are non-pharmacologic and are behavioral. And it's critical because in the face of the failures we've had to make a difference in the disease so far, uh, it's important with the richness we have now of understanding of basic and underlying processes to be targeting as many as we can of these potential 
causes of disease. And so this is just an example of the infrastructure that, with the increased funding in particular, we're able to put into place. It ranges from basic discovery to find new genes, to translate that into targets, how those genes and their products might become targets for drugs, testing those drugs in animal models or in IPS models that use the, the, the new wealth of techniques, including CRISPR-Cas, which uh, means we can induce and reverse the mutations which we know are causative or risk factor for disease, uh, an, an un, unprecedented partnership. And happy to say that across these, I want to illustrate in detail, been the source of highly productive public-private partnerships. These are largely then, many cases, pre-competitive with industry, have industry, biotechnology, having together with academic and federal support come to recognize that by putting their force to bear on these problems, they have the maximal chance of getting to the point where then enterprise translation into business and ultimate success can occur. And this in the final slide is the example, just the outcome of, of one of these initiatives, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, public-private partnership, which started by looking at gene targets, looked at how those genes affect expression of multiple genes in the brains of Alzheimer's that differed from those in brains without Alzheimer's, translated that into those which are most druggable and the best candidates or interventions. And this is a preliminary list of what happens when experts get together and identify what they think are the leading candidates, so-called wall of targets now, all of which become a multitude of points of, of addressing uh, research, all of them now hopes for places to make a difference. An example, I think, of the excitement there is in a field which remains a, a challenging source of so much suffering to us. And the translations I've shown you here, Alzheimer's is a particular disease, the way in which we similarly can intervene around the basic underlying process of aging with the hopes in geroscience of addressing many of the conditions of aging are a bit of information I want to share with you, hopefully inspirational as it is, as it is to us, and to remind again all of you that uh, with the increase in funding uh, comes an increase for opportunities that include public-private partnerships. So I know some of you involved in, in particularly the small business programs that allow NIH to fund partnerships or efforts by business. Uh, any, any and all innovations, not only in the science, but in the ways in which we can work together uh, are an exciting part of the prospects for us. And so I'm especially privileged to be here among all of you as a part of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.